Good morning, Faith Community Church, and good morning, everyone watching online. Uh, for those watching online, you won't notice that we still have a crowd of people coming in. So as you're coming in, uh, we just, we're just grateful you're here, and I hope you've been having a, a good week, regardless of the very sporadic weather conditions. Uh, for you, you all watching at home, you really don't have to worry about that. You get to, to worship and you know, seek Jesus today with us while uh, in the comfort of your home without worrying about rain. That's pretty cool. So <laughs> praise the Lord, we get to do that. So I have a few announcements for you all this morning, which you can find these in your bulletin. Um, and a, the few announcements are we have a book discussion group that is coming up this Tuesday. Make sure you mark that in your calendar. This Tuesday, August 18th. Now your bulletin um, may say August 16th on it. It is August 18th. Um, that is the real date. So this Tuesday, August 18th, it is from 6.30 to 8 p.m. And it is the third Tuesday of every month. So if you want to be frequent in that group, just make sure to mark in your calendar the third Tuesday of every month. And it's for any adult who is, who is 18 and older. And you can check out resources right after this service by going to the library. Um, if you all know where the library is, right down the hallway here, you are allowed to go there after the service today and check out any resources and sign up for these discussion groups. And if you would like more information, please contact Beth Young for that, which her contact is in the bulletin. So make sure you check that out. Another event we have coming up is a, uh, a cool fishing event happening this Saturday, August 22nd. And this is for our children ministries and our teen ministries. So if any of you are, are children or teenagers, or if you have children or teenagers who would like to go to this event, it is a really sweet thing. We're happening at a local farm. We will be fishing. We will have hot dogs. We will have ice cream. All this happening, and families are invited. So, But we need a head count, so make sure if you want to go, you RSVP by uh, August 19th, and the way to do that is by contacting the church office. Again, that is in your bulletin, so make sure to check that out if you would like to go to that. And if this isn't a plug enough that we have fishing uh, hot dogs and ice cream, Joe Flamer is giving a devotional, so if you want to come and hear Joe, this is a great opportunity for that. Um, as for masks, they are optional since this is an outdoor event as long as social distancing is maintained. So make sure that um, you, you bring a mask just in case, but you will not need it as we hang out and have good fellowship outdoors. And now we have my wife, Brittany Fowler, is here to uh, give a little, uh, a little insight of how Vision Group was for us. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Brittany Fowler. I've been going to the church for about a little over a year now. I started going, coming here last June when my husband and I got married. Um, but I just wanted to take a moment to share with you about my experience in our small groups. So um, I was going to the Klaus's small group. It was a group of about 10 individuals, and we were all of different ages and all of different stages of life. But it was so refreshing to be able to be part of that small group and come together and just learn and get to know each other um, and able to learn about Jesus, too. And I think it was really cool because we were able to come together in unity with the union of our mutual love for Jesus Christ. Um, so it was wonderful to be able to get to know some of the people that were there. But also, um, I think small groups is just such a wonderful avenue to get to know people, because especially for myself being new to the church. It was an opportunity for me to be able to learn about each other and um, deepen our growth inside of Jesus, is learning through um, spiritual disciplines and going over our vision group statement. And um, it was just such a great opportunity. I was so thankful for it. And um, I would encourage you that if you get the opportunity to think about doing it coming up as well. Um, I know that we do have um, some groups that are already filled up, but don't let that intimidate you from signing up for the group as well, because we are willing to accommodate if there is not enough room in the group. So, Thanks. And with that, let's uh, pray for the service. Dear Lord, thank you so much for, for bringing us here and giving us opportunity to worship and, and seek you and know you deeper, Lord. And it's so sweet that we get to have groups, we get to have small groups, we get to have events for our, our young, young people ministries, and we get to have you know, study groups. And Lord, we get to do all these things, even during this tough time, because you have provided a way for us, Lord. And, and no matter what's going on in this world, we are in you, and we as a church are, are part of your family, and we get to know you, our beautiful Savior, who, who gave his life for us, Lord. So, so today, as we worship you, as we hear your word preached, we pray that you open our hearts to, to know you deeper, to grow closer to you, and to feel the, the joy and peace that is offered through your Son, Jesus Christ, Lord. We want to know that more today. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, it is so good to see everybody. Um, every week we seem to have more and more people coming back, which is a, a joyful thing. Um, so please join with us now as we worship. Uh, we will have to remain seated. Hopefully that's not for too much longer. Uh, let's worship the Lord together.
our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as the back in the path. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your
everyone. Just wanted to, to give a quick reminder that uh, for our offering, if you would like to give, we have a box there in the back. While you're on your way out, you can, you can go there, or you can use this box over here, or, or you could use our online system. Just go to our website, scroll down, and you'll be able to see online giving, and you can use that um, as a way to give. Um, so with that being said, let's pray for the offering. Lord, we know that, that you have given, given us life, Lord. You've given us life abundantly. You've given us more than we could ever ask for in your son, Jesus, Lord. And, and even after saving us, Lord, you've given us things that we can do to serve you, serve your kingdom, Lord. You've given us purpose in life. And I pray, Lord, that, that you remind us of our purpose and that, and that you also draw us into a, a servant's heart, Lord. And one of those opportunities we have to serve is, is to give to you, knowing that what we give is going to be used for, for your glory, Lord. And it's going to be used to invest in your kingdom. So, Lord, bless the, the giving that we have today during this offering, Lord. And I pray that it's used to, to further your kingdom and to share your name. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And now we have Donna Chapel here to uh, give some announcements on Operation Christmas Child. boxes and they can be in this little class and learn all about Jesus and then they can share him you won't believe with their friends and then their friends share with their mother father and then their mother and father share with the minister and first thing you know a whole church has been formed from one box and I want you to remember that remember please remember that have you begun to think about your boxes? I was here last month, and I wanted you to be, start thinking about your boxes, what you're going to put in them. And there are lots of things going on sale now everywhere, and so you can get some good bargains. I know the pandemic has caused a lot of confusion. That may be a mild word to put, but a lot of confusion. I don't want it to cause any confusion with whether we're having the boxes or not. I've received a couple of calls about that. Donna, are we going to have the boxes this year? Oh my goodness, yes, we're going to have the boxes this year. And next month, September the 13th, we're going to have our kickoff. And I want you to be here. I want you to invite other people here because it's going to be something fun. And I, it's exciting. It's exciting to me. It's exciting to the people that will be in it. Oops, I almost told it, didn't it? So I want you to be here, be here next month for the kickoff. And at that time, those of you who do not know much about Operation Christmas Child, we'll have boxes. We give you the boxes. You fill the boxes, but we give them, and they're free. So plan to be here to get your boxes. Uh, remember that these boxes go out to children all over the world, everywhere. And the more boxes we fill, the more children will hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, just like I said, and that Jesus loves them. Last year, does anybody remember how many boxes we filled? 769. 769. Now, do you think we can come close to that number? I think so. But it's going to take everybody working hard to pack these boxes. And I'll be talking about it more as time goes along. Thank you. Pray for those boxes. Pray for the people, the children that will receive those boxes. Donna, thank you so much. We so appreciate all your work that you put into that to uh, give us the opportunity to serve the children of our world. And uh, we want to thank you for that. <clears throat> this morning, I am privileged to bring the Word of God to you. And uh, it, is, it is a joy to be able to share with you what the Lord has been teaching me and how he's been working in my life. And uh, I am, I'm excited to bring that to you this morning. So it's a matter of life and death. What I have to say today is a matter of life and death. So I'm going to ask that you open your Bibles or point your devices to the Gospel of Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 18. We will start there. So Luke is one of the four Gospels which you will find at the beginning of the New Testament section of your Bible. The Gospels 
uh, are the account of the time, the years that Jesus spent on earth. And so we'll read together Luke chapter 9, verse 18. Catch the drama of what's going on here. Uh, Jesus has already had some, some time of ministry, and uh, he is spending time praying, and now is the time for him to, to talk to his disciples about who he is and what he came to do. So he starts out, it says, And it happened that while he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he questioned them, saying, Who do the people say that I am? They answered him and said, John the Baptist, uh, and others say Elijah, but others that one of the prophets of old has risen again. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter, bold, confident Peter, speaks up right away and says, The Christ of God, meaning the Messiah, the, the one who has come to save, the anointed one from God. And then there's this turn here. You'd think this would be a, 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 an exciting moment, but Jesus sort of backs up now, and he says, but he warned them, and he instructed them not to tell this to anyone, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. And then he said to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, wait, come after me? Come after me to be killed, to be rejected, to suffer? Yes, if anyone comes after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. Now I want to show you a word that appears in both sections of this, it's the word must. Jesus says the Son of Man must suffer and by implication must be rejected by the elders, must be killed, and must be raised on the third day. When he turns to the disciples, he uses that same word and he says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. Just as Jesus saying, just as I must suffer and be betrayed and be killed, you must deny yourself and you must take up your cross daily and follow me. Jesus reiterates this teaching to his disciples later on in Luke, and he says, if anyone does not take up his cross and follow me, he is not worthy to be my disciple. Now in the Roman culture, uh, every criminal who was condemned to crucifixion had to bear his cross. Probably that means that he bore the cross piece, what they call the patibulum. He would bear that and carry that from the, from the courtroom or from wherever he was tried. He would carry that over to where the crucifixion would take place, bearing the weight of that cross. So when Jesus is saying that as his followers, we too must bear that cross, He's saying that we are taking on the position of someone who's condemned to die. He's saying that his followers, that would be you and I, that we must live like we are on our way to our own crucifixion. If we are following Christ with a cross on our shoulders, then we're only going one place, and that's to the place of our death. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a 20th century martyr, puts it this way. He said, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Today, we are going to examine what it looks like to deny ourselves, to bear our cross. If Jesus says that in order to be worthy to be his disciple, we must bear our cross, then we need to give the special attention this morning. Please pray with me as we prepare for the word of God. Lord, we come to you needing to learn this. Lord, we want to be worthy of following you. Help us, Jesus. Help us to hear your word. Help us to learn what it means to die to ourselves. We want to follow you, Lord. Empower us. Give us hearts to hear now. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So first, what Christ does not mean when he talks about bearing our cross. He is not talking about living with an irritable spouse or a wayward child or working with, an, with a miserable boss. He's not talking about giving up chocolate or giving up going out to eat until Lent is over. He's not talking about any of that. He's talking about the cross as an instrument of death. When he says that we must bear our cross, he is saying that we must take on this death. And it's really, it's the idea of denying our whole self, not just denying our self of chocolate or anything else, but denying our entire self. Now, this word deny is the same word that's used to describe Peter's great denial at the end of Jesus' ministry. Now, this Peter who was so bold before and said, you are the Christ of God. At the end of Jesus' ministry, Jesus is being taken to court and Peter's following him at a distance. And he's questioned about his connection, his affiliation with Jesus several times. And each time he denied having any connection with him. He disowned him. He turned his back on him. And he fully rejected Jesus when the heat was on. So to deny myself, if I'm going to apply this same word that's used in both places, to deny myself means that I must disown my rights. I must turn my back on my own demands and I have to give up the right to my own way and the right to rule my life and to give up my self-centeredness. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up, denied himself for me. I think it would be helpful to actually put some clarity on what this looks like. And I, I believe the Bible teaches that there are three kinds of deaths that we must go through as believers. The first is death to sin. And we see this in, in several passages. I'll bring a few of them to your attention. Galatians 5.24, we have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. The Apostle Paul also writes in the book of Romans, for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed, freed from sin. Now, this should happen upon our salvation. Being dead to sin means we renounce it. It means we give up its rule. What I'm talking about here is repentance, is that, that deliberate decision to turn away. I'm going this direction, and I make a deliberate decision to turn away and go this direction. And this is, this is really what happened with the Israelites. When they crossed over the Red Sea, it was as if they died to their old slave masters. Their slave masters could no longer have any power to them because they could not reach them. Another example is Harriet Tubman, who, who walked for miles in slave country, and when she crossed over to the border of Pennsylvania, it was as if she had died to her master. Her master could no longer reach her. Eventually, of course, we know that changed, and she, she wound up taking many slaves up to, to Canada, but it's the same idea. They would cross over to the Canadian border, and it was as if they had died to their slave masters. Their slave masters could have no power over them anymore. So when we decide to follow Jesus, it's not just saying, God, I, I just want all the blessings that you can give me. If that's all following Jesus is about, then it's no wonder we're stuck in our sin. But when we follow Jesus, we're saying, Jesus, you are now on the throne of my heart. And as far as my sin is concerned, I am a dead man. I am a dead woman. I am dead to that old master. That old master can no longer have power over me and my heart. When we come to Christ for life, we die to our sins, and sin no longer has the rule over us. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 6, all of us were baptized I believe, oh no, I, I don't have this on the, 
the PowerPoint. All of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, who were baptized into his death. We therefore were buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have new life. What this is saying is that because we share in Christ's death, we also share in the forgiveness that he gives that comes from his death. And we share in the power that comes from his resurrection. So I do want to make something clear, though. When we talk about being dead to our sins as believers, we're not talking about never sinning again or being sinless. I would love to be sinless, and and I know that you would too. And one day, when we are with Jesus in his presence, we will no longer have to struggle with sin. But I want to make a distinction here. So as a believer, I might sin, but I'm on the road to greater holiness. I'm on the road to becoming more and more like Jesus. In other words, Jesus is shining more and more in my life as I submit more and more to him. I I like how the Bible teacher, J.D. Greer, puts this. He says, it's not sinless perfection, but a new direction, right? It's not sinless perfection, but a new direction. I was living this way, I've turned and I'm going this new direction. I may still sin now and then, but I'm going this direction. Now that's very different from what Paul is going to talk about here in Romans where he says, if we have been freed from sin, how can we continue to willfully live in it? You see, I might still be caught under sin, under its clutches and submitting to its power instead of to the power of Christ. In other words, how is it that sin can still have power and rule over me if I have been freed from it? You see, you as a believer, you are a freed slave. So why do you keep going back to your old slave master? If this describes you, you don't have to stay stuck here. There are brothers and sisters here who can help you on your walk help you step into the freedom that Christ has for you. This is not something that's just for other believers. This is for you. Christ wants you to have that freedom from sin. And and I'll remind you that, that you're either moving toward God or you're moving away from him. You're either moving forward or you're going backwards. There's no standing still. Now, the fact that we can even die to sin is only made possible through the cross of Jesus Christ. We could never do this on our own. He died to take away the power of sin and the penalty of sin. And it's our identification with Christ that makes this occur in our life. So when we we receive Jesus as our Savior, we're saying, I identify with your death and resurrection, and I want to live under that power. Now, we show that, though, we show that through baptism. You see, it's baptism that we actually visualize for other people to see that we have identified with the death of Christ and then have received the power of life again as we go under and over the water. Now, if you are following Jesus and have not been baptized yet, would you please do it? This is so important that you do this. It's publicly showing a new identification. And if he has done this, if he has freed you from your sin and has brought you to new life, why wouldn't you want to show this publicly and attest to the great work that Jesus has done on the cross for you in your life? So don't wait another day. Believer, Talk to us. If you have not been baptized yet, we want to have a baptism service, and we would love to have you be baptized there. But if you're here today and you've not followed Jesus, you've not received Jesus as your Savior, you've not accepted his forgiveness, and not repented of your sin, then you cannot identify with him in his death or resurrection. This means that you have not been freed from the tyranny of sin in your life. It still has power over you and will rule until your death. Now, by saying that, I want to make this clear. It will rule until you physically die. But even then, it determines what happens after that. Because 
if you haven't given your sin over to Jesus and live a new life, then you're condemned to an eternal death and separation from God. Or sin will rule until your death, meaning your spiritual death. When you learn to die to yourself, die to your sin, this is when it will stop having rule in your life. And again, I believe or I say to you, or unbeliever, I say to you, why wait another day? What are you waiting for? Do you want sin to rule in your life? Is that how you want to be identified? Give it up. Come into life that Jesus gives. There is a second death that we are taught about in Scripture, and this is death to self. Now, death to self is not something that happens once to us that we're told to remember. Instead, this is something we do to ourselves. In fact, Jesus said that we do this to ourselves daily. He said, take up your cross daily. It's a repeated act on our part as believers. It is something that we deliberately do. Now, to be clear, we cannot do this with the, without the Spirit of God being in us. This is not something we do on our own. Jesus must do this in us. But with his empowerment, I am capable of turning my back on my own will, turning my back on my own desires, leaving my own demands. Dying to self is the continual denial of my flesh that occurs over my lifetime. It is the daily putting aside of our sinful desires and our selfish will. I like to think of it this way. Let me, maybe this will help make it clearer. When I receive Jesus and repent of my sins, I'm saying, sin, you get off the throne of my life. Jesus, you take over. You are my new king. But then every day and many moments through the day, my, my self-will grasps again at that throne and says, I want it again. Jesus, I want you to get off. I want, I want that, that throne over again. I want to exalt myself. But when I put a stop to myself and say, no, Jesus, this is your throne. My heart is not my own anymore. It belongs to you. And I want to, I want to live it by you. Then that's when I'm dying to myself. Now think about it. Every time I sin, I'm saying, Jesus, I'm taking the throne for now. I'll give it back when I'm done. Right? And this shows up most of all in our interactions with others, doesn't it? You know, before I got out of bed in the morning, I am such a good Christian. <laughs> you know, I just, I know all the things I'm supposed to do, and I do them all in my head. But as soon as I start interacting with the rest of the world, it is so challenged, and, and I live a very different way. And uh, so I, my favorite verses on this is, is also comes from the Apostle Paul, the book of Philippians, chapter 2. You may be familiar with this, but just hear what Paul has to say, say here. He says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among you, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, in other words, something to be held onto, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross and then the next verses say, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This working out of your own salvation is dying to self. It's learning how to die to self. So, uh, what this passage is really saying is that if I'm going to die to myself, you are more important than I am. Your interests are more valuable than mine. I need to stop grasping at my own rights and start upholding yours. And I must be willing to be Jesus to you. The Bible makes this so practical. Here are, I'm, uh, is a list of just a few of the commands that we have. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. 
through love, serve one another. Bear with one another in love. Give preference to one another in honor. Clothe yourselves in humility to one another. So let me make this painfully practical for you. When there's conflict in your life, a good question to ask yourself is, am I submitting to this other person out of reverence for Christ, or am I exalting myself? A good question to ask may be, am I loving this other person and serving them, or am I seeking to be served? Perhaps another question is, am I bearing with this other person's idiosyncrasies and differences, or am I thinking my way is the right way? I could ask, am I giving preference to this other person over my own preferences? Or am I being humble? That's very convicting to me. And I can't do that on my own. I can only do that through Jesus. But, you know, if every sermon is supposed to have an application, this is it right here, people. This is the application. If you do this, your life will change. Our church will change. Our community will change, and this world will change if we kingdom people start living like the king. This is how we do it. Christ preached about this in the Sermon on the Mount. This is how he lived himself. He gave us this example. If we're not doing these things, then we're not dying to ourselves. And and here's a way to think of it. If I'm not dying to myself, then the only thing I can offer you is my compassion or my forgiveness or my bearing with you. And I will tell you that will run thin and dry up very soon. But if I, have, if I have died to myself, then I am allowing the life of Jesus to live through me, and it's his compassion that I can extend to you, and his forgiveness, and his humility, and his bearing with one another, and that will not dry up. That will not go away because he is infinite. That's what it means to die to ourselves. His kingdom is cultivated when his kingdom people are living like our king. And that's what we're called to do. There is a third death. This is called death to the body. Now, I I honestly, this was new for me as I studied this, and I'm not sure I even grasp it fully. So I just want to share with you some of the things, and I, I, I feel like I have to spend more time in this myself. I get this from a couple of verses, uh, passages. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, he says, we, talking about him and his colleagues who who are giving out the gospel, he says, we are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest or shown in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifest or shown in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. And then in Romans, he says this in this familiar passage, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So it seems that for kingdom people, There is a continual dying of our body for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of bringing the gospel to others. At the same time, there is a continual renewal of resurrection vitality in our bodies, the renewal of life that comes from the life of Jesus in us. 
And Romans 8 speaks of this as well. It says, but if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. So far, today, we have talked a lot about death. Death to sin, death to self, death to our bodies, self-denial. And I'm afraid that if we stopped here, we might think somehow that if I'm supposed to give up all of this, all of who I am, I must be pretty bad. I must be pretty awful. And and I probably have no worth. You might actually think that if I'm called to die to myself, that I probably have very little value. But there is another truth in Scripture that we have to settle on today, and this is beautiful. Much of this comes from this book that I've been studying called The Cross of Christ, The Cross of Christ by John R. W. Stott. An excellent book, and and he says in his book, he says, nobody who reads the Gospels as a whole could possibly gain the impression that Jesus had a negative, negative attitude to human beings or encouraged one in others. In fact, the opposite is the case. We see how highly God values us in four, four places in, in Jesus' reality. First is in the teachings of Jesus. Pastor Mike has been preaching on Genesis, and he just covered the the creation of mankind, the fact that we bear God's image. Jesus affirmed Genesis 1,400 years later than Genesis was written. Jesus is affirming the doctrine of creation. He confirms that mankind is the crown of God's creation and that mankind bears the image of God in male and female. It doesn't matter, king or beggar, we all bear the image of God. And that gives us an incredibly high value. We also see how highly God values us in the attitudes of Jesus. My word, he honored those who were dishonored. And he, he lifted up those who were oppressed. And he accepted those who were rejected. Jesus invited children to himself. He reached out to Gentiles and to Samaritans who were victims of racism. He touched those with leprosy. He allowed a prostitute to kiss his feet. He made friends with outcasts. Jesus acknowledges and values and loves each one of these and each one of us. And that gives us value as well. And it speaks of how highly he valued us. We also see how highly God values us in the incarnation. And we read about this. The incarnation is when, when he, got being God, took on flesh, took on f- human form. When he laid aside all the privileges that he had in his heaven and gave them up for you and me. He was made nothing and chose to occupy the position of a servant Certainly he did this because it brought him glory. But we cannot, we cannot deny the fact that he did this because he so highly valued us that he had to become one of us in order to rescue each of us from our bent toward evil and death. And finally, we see how highly God values us in the death of his son, Jesus. Oh, you know this. God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son. Jesus became a human so that he could die for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. No doubt. He did this for his own glory, but again, he did this because we were extremely significant to him. For him to have gone through the suffering and the rejection and the death for us, this gives us great value. Again, John Stott says, it's only when we look at the cross that we see the true worth of human beings. 
he must put such high value on us. How can we ever self-loathe, right? If we can understand how highly Jesus values us, how could we ever hate ourselves? I, there is a bishop whose name is William Temple, and he said this. I think this is beautiful. He said, my worth is what I am worth to God. Let me say that again. My worth is what I am worth to God. And that is a marvelous great deal for Christ died for me. We can't separate our worth from the work of Christ. Okay, so am I talking out of both sides of my mouth? I, I, you know, the first part of the sermon, I'm saying we've got to deny ourselves, self-death, death to sin, give up ourselves. And now I'm saying, look how highly valued we are and, and God values us and we are, we are to be affirmed in ourselves. Well, that's a little confusing. And it is confusing because we are confusing people, aren't we, right? You see, we are created to bear the image of God. But because of the fall, which Pastor Mike is going to be preaching at over, the, over in the next few weeks, the fall of mankind where, where our first ancestors rebelled against God, because of that fall, the image of God that was perfect and beautiful in then is now defaced and marred. You and I bear both, don't we? I am the image of God. I am the defaced and marred image of God. I was created in this image to, to be beautiful and be creative and, and to be a wonderful creation, but that has been marred and, and greatly affected in a negative way by the sin, the sin of our parents and our own sin, to be clear. Again, I want to quote John Stott in this. I think he says this so beautiful, so beautifully. Listen to this. He says, so then, whatever we are by creation, we must affirm. Our rationality, our sense of moral obligation, our sexuality, whether masculinity or femininity, our family life, our gifts of aesthetic appreciation and artistic creativity, our stewardship of the fruitful earth, our hunger for those, uh, or, or I'm sorry, our hunger for love and experience of community, our awareness of the transcendent majesty of God, and our inbuilt urge to fall down and worship Him. This is what we affirm. But whatever we are by the fall, however, we must deny and repudiate our irrationality, our moral perversity our blurring of sexual distinctives and lack of sexual control, the selfishness that spoils our family life, our fascination with the ugly, our lazy refusal to develop God's gifts, our polluting and spoiling of the environment, our antisocial tendencies that inhibit true community, our proud autonomy, and our idolatrous refusal to worship the living and true God. But there is still one more aspect that I want to add to this, and this is only for believers. You see, unbelievers are left with just this. You're created in the image of God, and you have all, all that God desires and, and wants for you. But that image has been, has been marred badly and defaced. There's really little hope for freedom in that. There's no way you can discover who you really are. But for believers, through the death and resurrection of Jesus, we have been given new life. That means that we were not only created in God's image, and not only has that image been stained by original sin and our own, but God is working something new, and it's beautiful in us. He is recreating he is recreating and restoring the image of God that was spoiled by sin. 2 Corinthians 5 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. Colossians 3.10 says, We have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image 
of its creator. You catch that? After the image of its creator. And then Ephesians 4 explains the same things when it says that we have been taught to put off our old self, which belongs to the former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. That's the fallen image of God. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, here it is, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. People of God's kingdom, the image of God was defaced in you by sin, but God refused to leave you there. And through his son has forgiven your sin, conquered death, and has given you new life when you receive him by faith. So what does this all mean when we talk about self-denial? What I'm saying is that at the beginning, when we talked about self-denial and giving up ourselves and dying to ourselves and dying to our sin, I'm talking about discovering who we really are. I'm talking about giving up this and finding who this really is, who God created us to be. You see, without redemption, without being redeemed by the cross of Christ, we're stuck here. We can never give this up. But through Jesus, he's given us new life. And it's only then that we can find our true identity. It's only then that we can do the works that God has called us to do. It's only then that we can be the people that we were meant to be and the the person that you really want to be inside. It's only through Christ. This is exactly what Jesus means when he says, he who loses his life will find it. Lose this life, right? And find who he created you to be. We find the life that he intended for us all along. Jesus came to give life, and he says, and that life is abundant life. This is a redeemed and a recreated life, and it's hope. There's only, the only hope we have is found, found in dying to ourselves and then finding the abundant life that Jesus Christ has for us. Again, the Apostle Paul says, if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Now, for those of you who do not follow Christ, how can you resist? <laughs> how can you resist this? I don't know how you would want to be stuck in your sin, defined by rebellion or anger or complacency or arrogance. If you want to discover your true self, who you were really meant to be, you must know Christ. You must know his death and resurrection and identify with it and experience the love that Jesus has for you. Do you want to really live? Do you want to really live an abundant life? Well, you must know him and give up your own life. At the beginning, I quoted Dietrich Bonhoeffer who said, when Jesus calls a man, he bids him come and die. But he also said, Jesus Christ came to initiate us not into a new religion, but into life. Life in all its fullness. I want to close today by offering to you this life. If you are a believer and you're still chained to your sin, life can be yours. If you're not a believer and you know the death that you have in your life already, life can be yours as well. We're going to sing a closing song. This song is just such a beautiful prayer about what it means to live for Jesus and to give up ourselves. As we sing this, let this be a prayer. And and then afterwards, I'll come back up and, and we'll close the service out together. Thank you. Thank you.
Musicians will continue to play, and uh, our ushers will come and dismiss us. I want to thank you for being here today. Thank you for, for taking the time, coming out in wet weather, to be here, to hear God's word spoken, to be with God's people. I want to encourage you to sign up for the small groups that are out in the foyer. If you're escorted out this way, you are welcome to come back in and sign up for those groups. Unfortunately, with the rain, we might not be able to socialize out there today, but but we're grateful that you were here. But if you would like to respond to this message, just stay in your seat, and after people are dismissed, one of our elders will come and, and be with you and, and pray with you and, and help you in your next step in this. So again, the ushers will come forward now and they can begin to, to dismiss as the music continues. But if you'd like to stay and pray with somebody, just remain in your seat and we'll be joining you shortly.